Uh, as you said, Jordan from Fantacentric, red wine and Red Bull. This is going to be fun, folks. This is going to be fun. So, oh, yay. Right. Because this is lost in translation, what are these logos? The top left is Odeon. That's the largest cinema chain in the UK. To the right is Cafe Nero, the third largest coffee chain in the UK, with over 600 stores across the UK. And actually, they own a couple like Coffee House in Scandinavia and a few other bits and bobs. The third is Green King. They're a brewer, and they own over 1,000 pubs across the UK. My last startup, within four months, I had partnered with all of these three. Right? I, I am really good. I am really good at what I'm about to tell you about. I am really good at this, right? But how did I do this? And I guarantee you, if you get this, if you really get it, and you will, you'll be able to do this too for your business. So let's begin at the beginning, right? Red wine, it's big business, right? Big business is like red wine. It's mature, it's you know, well-structured, it's complex. Startups, it's like Red Bull, right? It's young, it's full of energy, right? Massive dreams. You want to you know, give you wings, you're going to fly them to the moon, you're so excited about what you're going to do, right? But what happens when you mix the two? <laughs> Tastes pretty bad, right? <laughs> so, like, they just don't mix. But let's ask ourselves a question before that, right? But why would we want to mix them in the first place? So, the reason why I come from this as a startup founder is we want to mix them because if you get this right, they can be the supercharger, the engine of growth for your business. Whether it's about access to their millions of customers, whether it's about um, you know, driving partnerships that open up you know, more credibility, more funding, or whether it's about international expansion. Do you team up with a global business that now enables you to like, hit new markets through their chain, access even to just their distribution network, their network, right? So there's a lot of really cool things you can get with by partnering or selling to big business. So how do we do this, right? So how to partner, and I want to say partner, because it's not always about selling. Sometimes it's just about like, look, you're looking for that big brother just to like bring you under their wing to mutually help each other out. And it's not about necessarily selling them directly a product that they're going to pay for. So how do we go from this to mmm, yummy, yummy, yummy. This is where I start. Principles, right? Most important place to start. Get yourself in the right attitude, the right culture, the right mindset to win. Can you sell ice to the, to the Eskimos? Quick question, right? So, I don't know about you guys, but I often got told, well, actually, <laughs> they're like, Jordan, you know, you're such a charming guy. You can sell ice to the Eskimos. Yay, right? And they say this as if it's like a compliment, right? The reality is you can sell ice to the Eskimos, but only once. Then they figure out what the hell it is, and they're like, whoa, there's all this white stuff, and you've just... I'm an idiot, you're an idiot, you're, you know. And they basically will never do business with you again. And more importantly, they'll probably go around and start talking to everyone they know, and they'll be like, stay away from that bad guy. You, you know. So the reality, and the reason why I bring this up is this, right? What's the first thing you think of in your head when you think of a sales guy, right? It tends to be someone like this, the guy who would sell his own grandmother to make five bucks, right? The guy that's going to kick you in the nuts, Right? Just to make an extra bit of margin on the deal. Right? The guy who's like the second-hand stereotypical car salesman. He is a bad sales guy. In fact, I would go so far as to say he is the worst type of sales guy. Because he doesn't get it. Now, he would say stuff like this. Oh, look, when you're selling door-to-door, -door, you know, the old school, right? You're going knocking on doors, you're trying to sell like an iron, right? It's like, it's now or never, right? So high-pressure techniques kind of make sense. They make sense, right? You're like, oh, I'm knocking the door, buy this iron before the door shuts, right? I say kind of. Why? Because in my view, 
in every case. The relationship is what matters, right? So worrying about closing the deal now is counterproductive. Focus on building relationships. And when I say relationships, I mean it in the most human sense possible. Think about like how, you know, who here is like in a relationship, got a loved one, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a husband, a wife, a fiance, right? Think about all the things that need to be true to make that relationship great, right? It's the human elements. If you focus on the relationship, you will win. And you will, yeah, you will win this. It's step one on the journey to like turbocharging your business. So, if it's about the relationship, honesty is the best policy. Because when you're looking at your husband, your wife, your fiance, and you'd say, hey, girls, who here thinks honesty is pretty integral to that relationship? Yeah, you kind of, it's pretty damn fundamentally strong, right? Honesty is absolutely integral. So it is the best policy. And a lot of startups and a lot of people make this mistake where they're too scared to be honest. They're trying to basically polish the turd. They're sprinkling a little bit of glitter, right, on their product, on their startup, and whatever they're trying to sell. And they're like, no, it's really great. Look, it's shiny. It's shiny, right? When in reality, what they should be doing is like, look, it's a bit of a turd, but we've got big dreams. I'm not going to put glitter on it. I'm going to tell you how it is, and I'm going to manage your expectations. Because I know this is a long-term relationship game, right? Number two, trust. Also pretty fundamental, right? Do you trust your husband? Do you trust your wife? I hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, get separate bank accounts and start preparing for that, right? <laughs> so the reality around this is like trust and transparency is really important as well. And it's very much linked to the honesty. And you can't forgo it. It is very much like the marriage. And I've been banging on about this because this is the way and the mindset you need to be thinking about this and approaching it, right? So if that's the goal, a loving relationship, a great marriage, right? with hopefully a big diamond, which is, let's put it in this case, on the startup's finger. Yeah. Right? That's awesome. Now, if that's what it is about, what's the goal then? The goal is to progress to the next date. That's it. If you think about it, right, when you're talking about marriage, you don't just meet someone and then on day four, get down on your bended knee and be like, hey, babes, here's a ring, marry me, right? That's retarded. There's a process, right? Where you sit there and you're like, look, let's grab a coffee. Maybe that coffee goes to a glass of wine. Maybe you go to the cinema, right? Maybe it turns into dinner, move into each other, and eventually marriage comes. But at every stage, you're just thinking, how can I progress to the next date? Whether that be the drink or the dinner or the cinema, right? So this is the mindset when you're building that relationship. You build it as you would in real life, step by step, building on that trust, building on that honesty, right? To eventually get the target goal, which is the ring on the finger. So, if you want to progress to the next state, how do you do that? Then the goal really is about stimulating interest, not closing the deal. I'm going to repeat this because repetition is the mother of skill, right? It's like, don't try and close the deal too early. Don't be that second-hand car salesman. Be someone who's just sitting there, who's stimulating enough interest to get to the next coffee, the next dinner date. Okay, so if you've got the mindset and you're already in like the zone of it's about the relationship that really matters, then when it comes to sales and specifically to B2B, like big corporates, big business, there is a bit of a process. And I got a lot of help with this for the guy called um, Richard Kelly in, in, in in London, who's a bit of a mentor to me on the sales front, because I wasn't naturally very good at this. There are some aspects that I were, but I wasn't really converting. And once he sat down and broke down a few things with me, and I started putting it to use, and it was a craft, I got better and better at it, I realized that actually there is a bankable process to go through. So the first stage to me is about finding, find and create, right? Finding and creating the opportunity is the lifeblood of your business, right? and requires continual focus, right? I see a ton of startups who don't 
um, ring fence a bit of their resource and time to continually building their pipeline, to continue to find and create new opportunities. What tends to happen, like top mistake number one, is like they, they sort of blindly chase this one target that they've got, and then they like push it through, and sometimes when they're lucky enough to like get it over the line, they're like, done. And it's like, oh, now what? And the reality is your business isn't going to grow at the rate you want it to unless you start putting back some time and reinvesting time into continually trying to find and create new opportunities. And this essentially is all in the customer de development phase, trying to find out, like, do you really understand your industry? Who are the best people to be partnering with or selling to? Does anybody really care? And like, just getting into this stage of finding and creating and exploring, right? And you need to be continually doing that. So within this find and create stage, I think it's really important to do the dream list. And it's about defining what success is from the outset, right? So it's like create a detailed list, sit down, take the time to do this, and of like all the people and organizations you would love to be doing business with, right? Create this list. If you think about it, one of the biggest luxuries you have as a startup founder, is you get to choose not only who you work with internally, but externally. So who your co-founders are, but also who your customers are. You choose that. So put the list down of who gets you excited, right? And then rank that list. And then basically, never start at the number one position. Why? Because you're going to be bad out the gate. You're going to be rusty, right? You want to get a bit more proof, a bit more momentum, and like, Iterate and learn on this process and how the relationship works, right? Before you start trying to tackle like the sexiest one, the number one, the Angelina Jolie on your list, right? Or the Brad Pitt for you ladies. <laughs> so, define and understand is the second stage. So, this is about sitting there and it's like time is your most valuable asset as a startup, right? So, you need to focus where you can be most successful, right? I see a ton of really potentially amazing businesses that just die because they run out of runway, right? You need to be sitting down every week and every month asking yourself this question, what is going to release the most value for us this week, today, this month? And you need to do this with your sales stuff, right? You need to rank your sales list and your pipeline and know what you're currently working on and being like, hey, these guys we started with first, and maybe we're a bit further down the track, but we've now started engaging with two more others, where it's probably going to be more profitable, or it's going to convert quicker, it's more applicable. So that's sexier. Actually, that's going to have a quicker timeline, so let's nail that now. Let's get a quick win. So understanding and defining and ranking is like the one of the big things I would ask you to do with all your opportunities, not just your sales opportunities. And again, understanding the need. Right? So if you can't understand the need, how can you sit there and propose a proper solution? And this is all about learning. So that's why I again talk about this as the customer development phase. You're trying to figure out what's the right product. Why do they really care? So in this defining and understanding stage, I talk about budget, right? So has the budget been put aside? Where does it sit? Right? Who with? How much is available? What's the flexibility on budget? It is never too early to talk about budget. And by the way, if you're going in and you're not trying to sell and close, and you're like, look, I just want to know about, we've got some solutions that may be working for you, but I want to understand your business, I want to understand your problems, I want to understand the need. If you're in learning phase and you ask about budget, they will tell you. If you're in sales stage and you're trying to kick them in the nuts and physically get money off the table, they won't tell you the budget, right? So this element around this, which is like exploring and finding out what the budget is, you want to find this out as early as possible. Why? Because if they don't have the money, if the budget's not there in the right time frame as well, then you might be wasting your time. You might be better off spending your resources somewhere else. Another thing to, to define and understand is to define the need. So what problem are you solving for them, not for you? Not what you perceive the problem to be, right? 
Get it from their mouth, their words, right? Has the prospect, so the person you're trying to sell to, confirm the need to change? Sometimes the needs are also quite emotional, and I'll talk about that later in the deck, as opposed to like definable. Sometimes it's just about the love, right? Hey, you can stop us using Excel. That's amazing. We hate Excel, right? Sometimes it's that simple. The other one is like the decision maker, right? Who is it? Are you sure? Are you really sure? Right? So a good example of this is within the, the previous startup that I mentioned, we started off in the early days targeting small in, like restaurants, bars, all this stuff. And I found out very quickly that talking to the manager who was like running the bar was a waste of my time. I needed to speak to the owner. They were the decision maker. Talking to the manager was just wasting my resource. So all I had to do was just try and find all the best ways to make it to the owner, because they were the one who were incentivized to partner with me, because they were the one who got financially rewarded if they made more money. It was their business, their baby, they cared. The manager who's running the place, his salary doesn't go up if like, you know, he improves turnover. He's not directly linked, he doesn't really care, right? All he's trying to do is turn up to do his day and get through it as painless as possible, right? doesn't care. So the other step in this is number three. It's, it's like propose and present, right? So it's important to demonstrate your product and your services are right fit for your customers. So this is where you sit there and you write that proposal or you actually put forward and be like, hey, like, buy this. Or like, and it's kind of, this is where you kind of think like, look, this is what we want to try to achieve about the partnership or why we're trying to get together, what you win, what we win, and like the proposed structure for doing that. This is the first time you show this. Because you've already defined the need, you understand whether the budgets are there, and you understand the problem much better. And then you're just basically, if you do this too early, what you end up doing is killing yourself out of the game. You risk doing that. Because what you do is you present something, and they go, no, nah, it's, not, it's not for us. And if you'd spent a bit of time asking questions and getting to learn them and what they really needed, you could have potentially tweaked that for them to suddenly look at it and be like, oh, that's awesome. We've got to, we've got to phone the big guy on that one. This one's going to change. This is a game changer, right? So this is, the, this is only at this stage you propose and present. And when you're proposing and presenting, it's about decision criteria. It's about sitting there and saying, what needs to be proved for the project to move forwards for them? Not for you, right? What's their success criteria? What are they going to be measured on? The people involved, the corporate as a whole, the division, the team, right? You need to understand it from what's going to get them excited, right? If you don't understand the de decision criteria and what's success for them, it's really hard for you to sit there and make that proposal right, right? Also, because sales cycle with big business does take a long time. Keep confirming throughout the sales cycle. Keep confirming that that success criteria, what needs to be true, is true. Compelling event. This is probably the hardest thing to understand in the deck, but it's also one of the most important. Finding that compelling event, what's basically driving the sale or the partnership from their side. Sometimes it's just emotional. It's like sitting there and saying, hey, we need, like, we know, sometimes just participating in the learning. It's like, we're going to partner up with this startup. We know big businesses basically, they look at startups and say, hey, your product's probably never going to deliver on all the stuff you say you're going to do. It's never really going to be changed, but we want to, to learn from you. It can be as simple as that. It's like, you're operating in a space that we're interested in disrupting in that is potentially really important for the future of our big business. So maybe the compelling event is just like, we need to learn on that. So the CEO said, hey, digital education is something we need to like, get better at. And you come along as a digital education, education startup, and you're like, hey, I can help you learn this. right? So finding what's driving it from their side is really important. Maybe it's a reaction, like their competitor's just done something, so it's, they're, like, they're all in like, panic mode trying to pull up their socks. right? Finding that compelling event that gets the individuals to be like, yeah, we need to do this. Some urgency, right? Some deep, long-lasting urgency, not a like, oh, it's pretty. Like, 
it has to have some, some like length to it. Now it is about the close. Step four is about the close, right? Only now, so you propose, you understand, you've gone through all the first steps. Only now do you look to try and get it over the line, get it signed, talk about budgets, get the money in your bank, or like start like activating that partnership in a meaningful well, way. So you've done the free trial, we've done this, now let's scale it. Let's go from Bulgaria to you know, Estonia to whatever, let's roll this puppy out. So getting it to close. So without the close of the deal, all of the effort you've done is delivering very little return. So this is all about converting your pipeline into real business for you. So the close is about sitting there because you get the find and create. So you're continually adding stuff to your pipeline. You're continually got these options. You're analyzing which ones are the most like, appealing for you to focus on now. But at some stage, you're gonna have to close some of these and like bank them, right? Don't do this too early. Don't be that second-hand car salesman. So, when you're trying to close, it's important to think about time scales, right? What happens next, right? What control do you have? Are you checking the progress regularly? I know a great startup that was killing it on B2B sales. They were just nailing it. But the sales cycle was six months. But they were going to succeed, and their entire pipeline was just going to convert. But it was going to take them six months to convert every one of those opportunities. Their runway, four months. They died. They were some of the best sales guys I've ever seen. But they ran out of money and they died because they didn't, at the beginning, understand the time scale from the corporate's point of view. Right? And it's like, what can you do to speed that along? How, like, if you know what the process is and the time scale, it's like, oh, legal needs to sign off on this. What can you do to push it into legals early to get their sign off, to progress it and to move it forward? You need to understand the full picture on the other side of the fence, their yard, right? But you need to manage this. Competition. Now, this is not just other suppliers. This can be cost of change or lack of a defined need. So cost of change, let me give you a real example. When we were partnering with Cafe Nero, I was like, look, you know, let's partner with us. And they're like, what is it going to cost us? And I was like, it's free. You just, you know, you come on board. We, like, we do this thing in all your stores. It's going to be amazing. And they're like, mm, it's not free. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, think about it this way, Jordan. To, to, to come on board with your business, we have to make sure that every one of our managers in all of our stores knows how, how your technology works. They need to train their staff. The rollout cost alone to our 550 stores, well, it's about 600 stores now in the UK, is pretty expensive. And it's going to take us like Q1, Q2 to roll it out. If you're not going to make me more money than it costs for me to implement it, why would I do this? So understanding that times it's just the cost for them to change can be a big competition for you. Right? Sometimes it's the fact that you just don't know what the need is. Right? It's like it's non-defined. There's also internal politics where you're going things and then some guy flies in from like HQ. It's like, okay, I was selling to Starbucks with a totally different startup. And I had Starbucks Hong Kong, Tokyo, and Singapore signed off. And the buggers said, oh, we'll just wait. You know, there's a business trip coming up. One of the guys from Seattle is going to come over. And you know, we'll, we'll wait to have, have a look at. And I'm ready, sort of, this is a physical product. I was like, yeah, we're getting the orders, I'm getting the manufacturers and the factories ready. And basically, the guy from the US flew over and was like, nah, this is a stupid idea. I'm not doing it. Like, wait, New York, nah. And he got back on a plane and he went over. The reality was, all the company heads in Asia were then in a lose-lose situation. If they it go against him and implement it, and it wins and it's an amazing success, they basically make their boss look like an idiot. If they implement it and it goes wrong, they look like a total idiot, right? It's like internal politics matter, and managing that wherever you can, and this is the art and the science of it, right, is really important. How do you do that? Just start doing this, get better at it. It's like entrepreneurship, it's a craft. Start playing. Finally, and this is often forgotten, serve and grow, right? For me, the most important sale 
is the second one a customer makes. Why? Because it's eight to ten times more cost effective. They're repeat. I don't have to go through this massive cycle again, right? I get so excited when people come back and buy more. And I get really annoyed with startups. Forget this. They don't manage the relationship. They're like, we've got the sale. Great. Woo. Let's go. And they're off to the next one. And they're not sitting there and thinking about how can they upsell. They've got the relationship. How can they build on that? How can they get them to come back again and again and again? And every time they're coming back, they're buying more and more and more. Because guess what? That is more cost effective and time effective for you as a startup. Serve and grow your current client base. Very important. Third stage, tips and tricks. Right, yes but. If I ever hear, okay, if you ever hear yourself, I was gonna say, if I ever hear you say this in a sales meeting, I'm gonna hit you around the head. I will do that, be warned. But for you guys, right, if you ever find yourself in a meeting and you're saying, yeah, but, so you're like, look, you know, it's HTML5, it's mobile responsive, and the guy's like, mm. and you're like, yeah, but, you know, it's also got like Excel integration, it's got an API, and, you know, it, it emails your grandmother, and it does your Christmas cards, and, and he's like, mm, don't really care, and you're like, ah, oh, it feeds your dog when you're away on holiday, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, and you keep coming back, and you keep defending your baby, your startup, your idea, and you're saying, yes, but, you're trying to do the hard sell. You are the second-hand car salesman, but you're probably more desperate because you're going, yeah, but, and you're defending your baby. So be an apprentice, not a salesperson. I guarantee you, if you sit there and you're in learn mode the vast majority of the time, you will actually get more partnerships and more sales. It's like, it's crazy, isn't it? Everyone's focused around how do you sell, how do you close? Focus on building that relationship and focus on learning, and you will naturally get better at everything else. Your conversion rate will go up. Wow. An apprentice, not a salesperson. Patience. B2B. Patience. These organizations are mind-numbingly slow to do anything. Make decision. Like anything at all, right? It will take a long time selling as a startup to big businesses. Right? But what I've also learned, it's not always dead. Right? There's this really interesting thing that I found, is that you think the sale is dead, and you're like, fuck it. I'm going to move on some other stuff. They're actually talking to me. And then like a month later, you get an email which is like, hey, Jordan, we've had a look at it. It's pretty cool. Like, when can you come in for a meeting? I'm like, oh, yeah, sh sure. Right? It's not dead until they tell you it's dead. Right? Don't shoot yourselves in the foot by ignoring and lack to follow up because you think it's dead because they're not calling you every Tuesday going, hey, Jordan, how's things? I just love your product. I just want to get it in. Let's do it, right? How are your kids, you know? Just think about this. Really think about this and just say, look, it's not dead until they've proved and told you categorically you have evidence that it's dead. Also, there's an interesting concept that I want to throw in here. Pay to wait. I did this with a, an interesting corporate, which is totally, it was amazing. They, I basically said, look, as a startup, I've got limited runway. It cost me money, time, and resource to wait for you to just do something, make a decision, run your process. Pay me to wait. And they did. It doesn't work all the time, but just think about it. It's pretty cool. So no basis for pricing new tech. This is one thing I've also learned. If your product is genuinely a tech product and is genuinely new, like mobile apps and stuff, big corporates have no standard to like benchmark to like be, oh, how much should this cost, right? They have no idea. So it's like you can set the pricing standard. And by the way, start high. I actually know a startup that when things got through and they were like six months into a relationship working with a, a big business, the finance guys realized what the margin was for the startup. And they were like, whoa, you're only making like 12%. Whoa, this, you need to make more money. So the, the company actually said, look, we're, just, we're gonna double what we pay you because we feel sorry for you, right? <laughs> I was like, awesome. But another element is like you need to do your admin. Admin is like one of the most important things to running the sales process, to going through those five stages and managing that. Nobody likes admin, but if you don't do it, 
You won't get there. I guarantee you that again. There's a lot of guarantees. You need to record all your meetings, right? Like the contact details, the learnings. You need to record what stage of sale, right? So this is about sitting there and like mapping out your, like your pipeline at what stage. And every time something shifts, you need to communicate this with a team. You need to say, hey, these guys, like they come back, it's like, now we're moving them further up the line. And you also need to define when you think the timeline is, like when you think it's going to close. Right? You need to keep an eye out to the future, and you need to be managing that. You're, like, so for me, I literally have an Excel sheet, which just has a couple of blocks, but all the sales leads from like, maybe they will talk to me, to we're talking to them, to like, we've been talking to them for a month, to like, we're doing a trial, to they're paying us, and I need to think about upselling them, right? So recording all this stuff and having that data there is absolutely essential to be able to, be able to assess and be able to to attack people and follow up and push and tickle people at the right time. It is also really, really important internally for communication amongst the team. No, like the knowledge shouldn't just be held on one person. It needs to be shared. People need to be able to add in and be like, oh, I can help there. Oh, that's important. Like when the tech guys don't do something, they're like, Jordan, like, I'm like, guys, you just lost us that deal because you didn't do that. And they're like, oh, I didn't know it was important. I was like, dude, I'm talking to Green King. They've got a thousand pubs. Just think about all that beer, right? Like, we need to do this this two weeks. They've, they've got an internal process where they're going to analyze it on Thursday. We need to polish this up for Thursday. And if they don't know it's important and they can't see it on a timeline, it's hard for them to understand that. So it's really important to communicate internally. It's also really important if you're going to grow your sales team. If you're going to bring external people in to build a sales team, a direct sales force to go out there, you need to have the information that they can readily access and it's not locked up in one person's head, right? So the information and the value is retained in the business. Also, constant, polite follow-up will always win. I will prove this to you. Ta-da! You can't see this. Or maybe you can, it's pretty big. So let me show you this. So Sherry Kutu, pretty big like investor woman, and I was like, oh, I really want to talk to her. So I sent her an email, which was an introduction someone made to me uh, on the 24th of March. I then said, dear Sherry, so I wrote the email on the 24th of March, big long Sherry, Sherry. and then on the 2nd of April, I was like, dear Sherry, I trust you had a great Easter, blah, 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 blah. No response. 10th of April, Sherry, good morning. Any thoughts on the below? Boom. And then suddenly, 10th of April, Debbie, please arrange a 50-minute call. Don't underestimate the power of guilt. Guilt is like so embedded in email. It's beautiful for a sales guy when he gets this, right? When you think about, think about email, right? When, you, when your most common feeling when people look at their inbox is like, oh, I've got to get back to them. But no one defined that, right? No one said, look, you know, when email was invented, oh, by the way, here are the rules. If you leave it for two days, you're being a bit of an asshole. If you leave it for a week, you're being a bigger asshole. And if you never get back to them, you're kind of embarrassed to see them at a cocktail party, right? Like, no one officially said that. The reality is, just sending polite, consistent follow-up is like one of the best ways to force them to engage because their guilt gets so high, they're like, oh, my girl, I'm gonna have to do something. And sometimes it's literally just the one-liner. So after any thoughts on the below, I just said, best wishes, Jordan, end. One week. So setting the time, what is appropriate to follow up is your call. But what do you think is appropriate? Is it once a week? Is it once fortnightly? That's your decision. And that's the art and the science of it, but follow up. This is another thing about admin, how I manage my inbox. This is taken on the flight out here. I have a folder, which you can't see on the left. This is a folder in my Outlook, and it's called Waiting For. As you can see, it's got my name. It's because I've sent these emails, right? I've sent stuff which I need a response back, or I need to chase, right? So an element around here is that I go into this folder every week, at least once a week, and do a full top to bottom review. So there's a guy somewhere there who's last month. Actually, I spoke to Conrad on the phone yesterday and I touch base with him on the phone. But I follow up and I make sure that's consistent and you will get amazing conversions with this. Now that's how I do it because I'm prehistoric and as you can tell it's Outlook so I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that. I may have been in a corporate at the beginning of my life. Shh. But use whatever works for you. There's a great startup called followup.cc. 
that enables this within Gmail that you just send an email. It's, it's awesome. Just look it up. Followup.cc. Use more tools. Phone. This is probably the most neglected bit of hardware slash technology today. 2013. It is crazy. It is crazy how few people pick up the phone. Especially in the world of sales. In the old day, sales was synonymous with a phone call. Like, like the sales guy always had. There's like, you know, it's like when the first mobile phone came out, that massive brick, it was like, who's carrying it? It was like sales guys, right? It was important. Now, no one uses it. And it's actually the channel, if you can think of it from a tech speak, it's the channel with one of the least amount of competition. It's the channel with the least friction, the least noise, right? People hate email. Like, we all get loaded with email, right? The reality about the phone is, and especially if you're building up a personal relationship, it's so powerful. You'll be surprised how quickly you can get someone on a phone than how you can get them to respond to your email. Don't be afraid to go old tech and like beat everyone else and get better sales conversions by picking up the phone. It might be scary to begin with, but once you start making millions of dollars because you're picking up the phone and your competitors are not, trust me, you'll love it. Doorstep. This is probably one of the boldest things I'm going to suggest. Doorstep is where I literally turn up. I turn up to the office. And I'm like, hey, I've got a meeting with John. And the reception is like, cool, have you got a meeting with John? I'm like, uh, I haven't booked it, but you know, I'm here to see John. And they're like, sure. John, someone's here to see you. Next thing you know, John appears. This guy who's been like eluding me on email for like months suddenly appears. I'm like, hey, John, it's Jordan. And he's like, oh. <laughs> and then he's like, let's have a meeting. Right? The doorstep is particularly powerful for bypassing gatekeepers. That's what the GS stands for. Gatekeepers are like the amazingly efficient secretaries that like filter out email and like normal phone calls that never allow you to get to like the big guy. Right? You doorstep them, boom. All the defense mechanism works. You know, it's, it's like the back door. It's like, whoosh, whoosh. hi, CEO, nice to meet you. It's really powerful. But I give it a health warning. Don't do it if you're not the type of person who can deal with this. Like That's about charisma. It's about your character. There are some people who would just be terrible at doorstepping because they'll go into the lobby and they'll turn into a full body sweat and they've got no charm. They can't like, there's a little bit of like art and science to like hustling here, right? But if you can and you have a hustler on your team, doorstepping is amazing for bypassing the gatekeepers. Also, Handwritten letters or cards. Old tech is so powerful. I am not going to lie to you how many deals I've closed because I played the relationship card, the personal card. I've sat there and just said, hey, I'm going to write you a handwritten thank you letter. Thank you for taking the time. I learned a ton. It was amazing. I'd love to like, reach out to you more. Like, let me know if that's possible. Handwritten letter by snail mail, it blows people's minds. They're like, whoa. This guy is a man. I want to do business with him, right? Postcards, a nice quicker touch, right? Bit less, bit more informal, less informal, right? More informal. Um, so go old tech, and it's really powerful. Flowers or gifts. Don't, don't, don't think this is also not true. Like flowers is a little bit crazy, crazy. But I sent like this guy at Orange who was doing Conrad. It was actually that guy on my email, Conrad, who's now like amazing relationship. We're doing a ton of business with Orange and EE globally. Um, I sent him a six pack of beer to say thank you once. And it was like, he tweeted it. He was like, this is amazing. But it's like, it cost me like four euros going to an off license. And I sent it to his, I dropped it off at his office. So email and LinkedIn are also other channels. You can get inboxes directly. You can pay with LinkedIn to directly force it into their inbox. Less conversion, but it's cool. Back doors. These are other back doors. I know I'm going to run slightly over time, but it's the final slides. Alumni networks. If you have alumni networks, universities, schools, MBA schools, they are genuinely powerful. If you've been on an accelerator program and you have that alumni network, tap it up. Use it or abuse it or just ignore it and lose the value you have. Go through your contacts and think about all the networks. Literally go through on your phone and think about every way you can get in the back door. Another trick that I pulled was private equity. I found out, so I got introduced to Cafe Nero through their owner, 
which is Hutton and Collins, which is a private equity fund. I just happen to have a couple of friends who work in finance, and London has a big finance sector, all the you know, M&A guys, the private equity guys, I know a few, because someone's got to buy me my dinners, right? <laughs> it's like, someone's got to feed the poor startup guy. So I called in some favors, and I was like, I found out that, start, that Cafe Nero was owned by this private equity fund. So I literally just went through him. I was like, buddy, this is what I want to do. It's going to be amazing for, for Cafe Nero, and he's like, done. And he emailed me direct to the CEO, because he owns the company. He's like, John, deal with it. John was like, uh, there's the guy who owns his ass, going, uh, okay. Then he filters it down, and then people couldn't ignore it because it came from the CEO. And that's how I got Cafe Nero. Supply chain. Think about who supplies their businesses. Who, do, who sells them anything? Like, what's coming into that business that you want to get to from your dream list? I got in to Odeon through the supply chain. Um, there was another business called Tuergo PLC that sold them this this black box bit of hardware back in 2000 that enabled them to do the orange two, I don't know if you get this, Wednesdays two for one cinema tickets. Anyway, they deal with orange and they supplied them this bit of hardware. And I was talking to them and they introduced me to Odeon. That's how it happened. Meetups is a great way to hack this. If you host your own meetup, you by de facto become like the VIP. So you invite a ton of really important people who you really want to like meet, and you like organize the event. So like Chris, Chris is gonna meet all these important, like the speakers, he's gonna be up at that level. It's like doing your own meetup in a smaller level, like running the event, hosting the event, is one of the quickest ways to like hack, growth hack, into like the big guys. And go through your contacts, do it. Wherever possible, do their work for them. Don't be lazy. As the sales guy, especially as the startup, you need to do everything you can to make their job decision process to get over the line so you win and they win as easy as it is for them, not for you. You're going to have to do the heavy lifting. Actively search out things, work, and jobs you can do to help them move it along. Don't be lazy. Finally, be a student of the game. A very good mentor of mine told me this. He said, Jordan, you need to be a student of the game. I was like, ah, what does that mean? And he said, even when you get good at this, Jordan, every day, pick one thing you want to learn. Never, ever, ever stop being a student of the game. Never rest on your laurels. Never stop learning. You want to sit there. Whatever game you're playing, every day, you want to be getting a little bit better. And just think about what's that one small thing you can do to learn today. And over time, you'll find yourself in a situation where you're like, this is good. Life is good. But then continue to don't stop. Continue to be a student of the game. That's it from me. If you want some really cool information about newsletters and stuff, education about how we basically make founders suck less, that's what we do at founderscentric.com, just go to that bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash fc hyphen list. Sign yourselves up and be educated. Awesome. Be a student of the game. Thank you.